Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir and I am an assistant professor at the Jindal Global Law School. Welcome to EPG Patshala on Civil and Political Rights and Module 16, The Right to Fair Trial under the Constitution of India, Part 2. Article 21 is the most significant provision in the Constitution as far as an individual's right to a fair trial is concerned. Article 21 has been given an expansive and liberal interpretation by the Supreme Court and is included within its scope principles such as the presumption of innocence, the right to an adequate defense, and the right to a speedy trial. Thanks to the judicial activism of the Supreme Court, Parliament amended the Constitution to include Article 39A, which guarantees equal justice and free legal aid to indigent persons. This module will seek to introduce you to the manner in which the right to a fair trial has evolved under Articles 21 and 39A of the Constitution. The purpose of this module is twofold. First, to give the students an overview of the constitutionally recognized components of an individual's right to a fair trial. Two, to help the students understand the manner in which the scope of the right to a fair trial has been expanded by judicial interpretation. And three, to give the students an overview of the legal aid framework in India. So let's get started with Article 21. Article 21 guarantees that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. So what are the three elements of Article 21? Well, the three elements of Article 21 are that first, no person shall be deprived of his life, element two, or personal liberty, and element three, except according to procedures established by law. What Article 21 is saying that the state can deprive somebody of their life or personal liberty. If they could not, you could never send anybody to prison or have the death sentence, for example. But when you deprive somebody of their life or personal liberty, it has to be according to the procedure established by law. It's on the interpretation of this phrase, procedure established by law, that a great amount of Article 21 jurisprudence has been built up on. In A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, while examining the constitutionality of a law on preventive detention, the court held that the meaning of liberty in Article 21 is restricted to personal liberty. They said, there, it's just personal liberty. They rejected the argument that natural justice must be read into Article 21 and held procedure established by law must mean procedure established or prescribed by the law of the state. What does that mean? Tomorrow, if the Parliament of India passes a law saying that all people who are bald will be shot, well, as long as parliamentary procedure is followed, the deprivation of, well, bald people of their life would be constitutional because that would be according to procedure established by law. This was the finding in A.K. Gopala versus State of Madras. The Supreme Court, however, overruled A.K. Gopala in the landmark case of Menaka Gandhi versus Union of India. A little bit of background of the facts of this case might be helpful. In 1977, the first non-Congress government came to power in India. The Janta Party which was, at, which was in power at the time, deprived Menaka Gandhi of an opportunity to travel abroad in, because it was in the public interest that her passport be seized. They gave her the right to a hearing, and but before that hearing could take place, Menaka Gandhi filed a petition in the court. Uh, Menaka Gandhi at that time was running a newspaper and which was sort of espousing the Congress cause, if you will, and the Janta government of the day took offense to it. Actually, the issues in play in Menaka Gandhi were on a very limited scope. But the Supreme Court looked at this case as an opportunity to overrule A.K. Gopalan uh, and also somewhat remedy the wrongs of ADM Jabalpur versus Shukla, the case where essentially the Supreme Court said that as long as the procedure was established by law and the right to life was even suspended during a time of emergency. So the Supreme Court sought to what write what it saw as a wrong during the emergency era in the case of Menaga Gandhi versus Union of India. So in Menaga Gandhi versus Union of India, the Supreme Court established what has come to be known as the Golden Triangle Test and sought to draw a thematic linkage between Article 14, the right to equality, Article 19, the right to freedom, and Article 21, basically the, the no person shall be deprived of their right to life or liberty except according to procedure established by law. There's a landmark as a landmark judgment, Menaga Gandhi today is considered the leading authority on Article 21. Let's quote, take a quote from the judgment. Article 14 strikes at arbitrariness in state action and ensures fairness and equality of treatment. 
principle of reasonableness, which legally as well as philosophically is an essential element of equality or non-arbitrariness, pervades Article 14 like a brooding omnipresence. And the procedure con contemplated by Article 21 must answer the best of reasonableness in order to be in conformity with Article 14. So essentially what the court is saying that Article 14 and Article 21 are linked together. Essentially, Article 14 guarantees you the right to equality and equal treatment before the laws. Essentially, the procedure established by law under Article 21 should not violate this equal protection clause in Article 14. Therefore, the Supreme Court said that it must be right, just and fair and not arbitrary, fanciful or oppressive. What should the procedure established by law? Let me repeat, the procedure established by law must be right and just and fair and not f arbitrary, fanciful or oppressive. Otherwise, it would be no procedure at all and the requirement of Article 21 would not be satisfied. So let's go back to our example of Parliament passing a law saying that all uh, people who are bald, all men who are bald should be shot. Well, that is arbitrary, fanciful and oppressive and not right, just and fair. So it would be no procedure at all and that law would be struck down as unconstitutional because it's not right, just and fair. Just because Parliament followed the procedure doesn't actually make that law right, just and fair. That's essentially the core of the holding in Menaka Gandhi. Here you see a picture of Menaka Gandhi in 1977 when the case was decided. Now, let's come to some cardinal principles of the right to fair trial and their recognition by the Supreme Court in case law. The presumption of innocence has been held to be a part of a fair and non-arbitrary procedure under Article 21. So essentially what the Supreme Court has said is that a procedure established by law essentially does not mean you can pass a law tomorrow whereby you overturn the very basis of criminal jurisprudence, which is that every person is innocent until proven guilty. In the case of Krishna Lal and others versus Government of Kerala, the Supreme Court clarified that the principle of presumption of innocence is entrenched in the Indian Constitution, the UDHR, that's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the ICCPR, the Civil and Political Rights Convention, to which India is a member. The procedure prescribed for trial must also stand the test of the rights guaranteed by those fundamental rights. So essentially, the procedure must not only be in conformity with our own constitution, but in fact, must be in consonance with the principles of uh, fair trial uh, embodied in the UDHR, the ICCPR and other international conventions and tre uh, treaties and instruments that India is a party to. So now we come to the burden of proof. In criminal jurisprudence, the settled law is that the prosecution must prove all the ingredients of the offences for which the accused has been charged. The proof of guilt of the accused is on the prosecution and must be beyond reasonable doubt. What is the burden of proof in criminal law? Always, always, always beyond reasonable doubt. Not balance of probabilities, not beyond doubt or anything else, beyond reasonable doubt. At no stage of the trial is the accused under an obligation to disprove his innocence. You cannot ask the accused essentially to do the prosecution's job for them. Unlike in a trial of civil actions, the burden of proof is always on the prosecution and it never shifts. The burden of proof never shifts. To place the burden on the accused to prove his innocence, the Supreme Court has held, is arbitrary, unjust and unfair and violates Article 21. In the landmark case of Dayabai versus State of Gujarat, the presumption of, an innocent, the presumption of innocence of a person was recognized. In this case, the Supreme Court, while considering the burden of proof in a case of murder and the defense of insanity, held that it is a fundamental principle of criminal jurisprudence that an accused is presumed to be innocent and therefore the burden lies on the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. We've already been through this. But what happened in Dayabai? Uh, in Dayabai, there was a murder. The prosecution in a case of culpable homicide should prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused caused death with the requisite intention described in section 299 of the Indian Penal Court. The general burden never shifts and it always rests on the prosecution. So let us assume that the prosecution has brought a case against an individual and says this individual is guilty of culpable homicide essentially. It is on the prosecution to prove that the elements of culpable homicide in section 299 of the Indian Penal Code have been satisfied. That burden is always on the prosecution and never shifts. However, there is an exception. The burden, of course, is always on the prosecution. But 
if the accused claims that the reason he or she killed someone was due to the fact that they were they were or are insane the burden shifts to the accused so let us say that the accused is a schizophrenic and the accused has been diagnosed as schizophrenic by a recognized psychiatrist the state has examined uh, the accused and basically the state says well no the accused is not schizophrenic so is the burden on the prosecution to prove that the accused is not schizophrenic and therefore was able to essentially have the necessary mens rea mens rea a latin maxim which essentially means the intention right was the per did the person have the capacity to essentially form that intent in their mind that is what is at issue when the prosecution accuses somebody of say culpable homicide or murder and that person essentially claims well no i could not i cannot be convicted of this because i was insane i am insane i am a schizophrenic in this scenario the burden of proving insanity is on the defense so what is the burden on the prosecution simply the burden on the prosecution is to prove that the act of murder took place the, or the act of culpable homicide the actus rea or was uh, the actus rea which is essentially the act itself right was committed they have to prove so let's take a case of a stabbing they have to prove that a stabbed b the the prosecution has to show that a stabbed b b does not have to uh, uh, a does not have to prove that he stabbed uh, does not have to disprove that all the prosecution has to do is to prove that a stabbed b and if a doesn't want to get convicted a can then put up a defense right and what if a's defense is well yes i stabbed b yes but i stabbed b because i was insane i stabbed b because i'm a schizophrenic and i was paranoid and i stabbed b there the burden does not really shift per se but it is on the uh, on a the accused to prove that he stabbed b because he was insane the burden of proving insanity is on the defense now the question is in a case like that does the presumption of innocence get displaced does the presumption of innocence get displaced that's what they were considered in the case of dayabai right and the supreme court said this the shifting of the burden does not displace the presumption of innocence and i quote if the judge has such reasonable doubt he has to acquit the accused for in that event the prosecution will have failed to prove conclusively the guilt of the accused there is no conflict between the general burden which is always in the prosecution which never shifts and the special burden that rests on the accused to make out his defense of insanity so the supreme court in dayabai essentially said okay there are two categories right there is a general burden and a special burden the general burden is proving the elements of the crime which is always in the prosecution the defense now the indian penal court recognizes some cer certain defenses to all crimes right if for example you are schizophrenic you murder somebody it's wrong on the part of the state to convict you and perhaps even sentence you to death because you don't it's not your fault that you were born a schizophrenic or you diagnosed schizophrenic and if you know in a fit of madness or insanity you killed somebody so essentially there's a special burden there why is that special burden on the defense well then tomorrow somebody can easily turn around and say well okay i i was insane prosecution prove that i am not insane how does the prosecution go about proving that you are not insane there are protections against self incrimination so can you force the accused for example to incriminate himself or herself the accused might not cooperate right so if the accused wants to claim the benefit of insanity that burden that special burden of proving insanity is on the accused is on the defense right and that is constitutional right the court in minaka gandhi held that the principle that no decision shall be given against a party without affording him a reasonable hearing was an integral part of natural justice and held that the court must court must make every effort to salvage this cardinal rule to the maximum extent possible in a given case so essentially in the case of menaka gandhi they said you have a right to a defense going back again you have the right to prove you were insane you have the right to prove you have you were insane right the court cannot deny you that or the laws cannot or laws cannot deny you that thus article 21 of the indian constitution embodies protection against arbitrary and unreasonable procedure that deprives a person of his life and liberty and also protects the right of the affected party to a reasonable hearing under india's code of criminal procedure better known as the crpc any person accused of an offence before a criminal court or against whom proceedings are instituted under the court may of right may of right be defended by a pleader of his choice you have the right to an attorney an advocate call it what you want of your choice the right to a defence is a hallmark of the right to a fair trial 
guaranteed by the constitution of india now let's come to the issue of a speedy trial in the landmark case of hussein ara khatun versus state of bihar justice bagwati who wrote the judgment considered the status of a large number of under trial prisoners in bihar some of whom had been in prison for a period longer than the maximum penalty prescribed for the offence for which they had been arrested and detained a sad state of affairs indeed the court held that the right to a speedy trial along with the right to legal aid were an essential part of any fair and reasonable procedure that was contemplated under article 21 so essentially in hussein ara khatun what the court held was look not only do you have the right to a defense an adequate defense you also have the right to a lawyer you if you cannot afford one it is incumbent upon the state to provide you with one it is incumbent upon the state to provide you with a public pleader who will argue your case for you and to will do so to the best of his or her ability so let's look at a quote from hussein ara khatun if a person is deprived of his liberty under a procedure which is not reasonable fair or just such deprivation would be violative of his fundamental right under article 21 and he would be entitled to enforce such fundamental rights and secure his release now obviously procedure prescribed by law for depriving a person of his liberty cannot be reasonable fair or just unless that procedure ensures a speedy trial for determination of the guilt of such person i've said this before and i'll say it again that age old principle justice must not only be done right must also seen to be done is one and the other is justice delayed is justice denied so in cartoon essentially bhagwati said no procedure which does not ensure a reasonably quick trial can be regarded as reasonable fair or just and it would fall foul of article 21 there can therefore be no doubt that speedy trial and by speedy trial the court meant reasonably expeditious trial is an integral and essential part of the fundamental right to life and liberty enshrined in the article that's article 21 the court also said that lack of resources is not a compelling argument something that the state cannot invoke they said the state cannot be permitted to deny the constitutional right of speedy trial to the accused on the ground that the state has no adequate financial resources to incur the necessary expenditure needed for improving the administrative and judicial apparatus with a view to ensuring speedy trial and this is really not a problem in india because lawyers are a dime a dozen the problem of course is what you pay public pleaders and that's an entirely different problem because the pay for public pleaders is not very good and there's no real incentive to take up the work of public pleaders so essentially you have lawyers who are not really the best in the cream of the crop doing defense work for people who don't have resources but in a country like india unfortunately this is problematic and this is a problem for which we still no solution it's all well and good to say on paper that indigent persons have the right to legal uh, to the right to a lawyer but can you get them a ram jeet malani and a kts tulsi no but why go so far can you even get them a competent lawyer well competency comes at a price and that's a price that the state cannot afford so the supreme court has said look you cannot say you cannot deny somebody a lawyer because of lack of resources but at the same time the state cannot be expected to provide the best lawyers they can give them what the best they can afford in sheila barse uh, the union of india and was union of india the supreme court held that the consequence of violation of the fundamental right to speedy trial would be that the prosecution itself would be liable to be quashed on the ground that it is in breach of the fundamental right to fair trial under article 21 so if you violate this right to speedy trial they will quash the case essentially what does that mean you start a case let's say in 1985 and 2015 is still ongoing they can quash the prosecution essentially because of delay that's how strict the requirement of a speedy trial is yeah, under the constitution of india according to the supreme court in state of bihar versus uma shankar ketiwal the high court quashed the proceedings on the ground that the case had been ongoing for 16 years the supreme court said with regard to the delay such protraction itself meant considerable harassment to the accused and there had to be a limit to the period for which the criminal litigation is allowed to continue at the trial stage here you are looking at a picture of the fast of the district court in saket where the fast track courts have been set up in a fast track court has been set up in delhi to hear rape cases and this was with the court where the nirbhaya gang rape case as well was heard now the case of abdul rahman antule versus rs nayak a landmark case in criminal law in india in uh, antule v nayak the supreme court 
examined the scope of the right to a fair trial and laid down several guidelines. It would be beneficial if we go through each of these guidelines as it would help you understand the scope and ambit and the protections of uh, the right to fair trial under the Constitution of India. So, first, the right to a speedy trial flowing from Article 21, the court said, encompasses all the stages, namely those of investigation, inquiry, trial, appeal, revision and retrial. So, what did they say? The right to fair trial doesn't mean it only commences when the trial starts. It starts from the very moment you are either arrested or questioned by the police. That's when it starts and it goes right up to the time you exhaust your avenues of appeal. So that would be starting from investigation, inquiry, trial, you appeal that, then you revise a revision application, which is essentially you apply to the court to revise some kind of decision that's been made during the course of a trial and a retrial if necessary. So the right to fair trial covers all these instances. The court also said, in every case where the right to a speedy trial is alleged to have been infringed, the first question to be put and answered is this. Who is responsible for the delay? Right? You can't just say there's been a delay. What if the accused is responsible for the delay? Do you quash the prosecution because the defense has caused the delay? What the court said was proceedings by either party in good faith to vindicate their rights and interests as perceived by them cannot be taken as delaying tactics, nor can the time taken in pursuing such proceedings be counted towards delay, as long as it's in good faith. Now, there might let's take the case of Shashi Tharoor versus Sunanda Pushkar. There has been such a protracted delay, and FIR has finally been filed after 15 or 16 months following uh, the discovery of Sunanda Pushkar's body. Now, can you say there that it's not been in good faith? We don't know. The facts are not clear yet. I mean, the the tests were conducted, were they done in good faith? You don't know. So the court will not simply say, oh, this case has been going on for so long, let's quash the prosecution. No, they will go into the facts in the, of the case and see, okay, have the parties acted in good faith, essentially. And like they said, you must take into account all the attendant circumstances, nature of the offence, number of accused persons, witnesses, court's workload, the prevailing local conditions. So what if it's in Uttar Pradesh, for example? If it's in Uttar Pradesh, the local conditions. What about, what if it's in Bihar? The local conditions matter basically is what the Supreme Court says. Every delay, this is important, every delay does not necessarily prejudice the accused. However, inordinately long delays may be taken as presumptive proof of prejudice. What does that mean? It's very simple. A case has been going on for 25 years. There is a presumption that there has been an inordinate delay. Then the prosecution essentially has to show, well, no, 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 no. Yes, okay, there's a presumption of delay, but let us displace that presumption. Let us displace that presumption that there's been an inordinate delay. Right? And it's very hard to displace a presumption, that presumption when there's been the trial has been going on for say 20, 25 years. The prosecution should not be permitted to become a persecution, was what the court said. But when the prosecution becomes a persecution, when it becomes a persecution, depends on the facts of a given case. So again, you can't lay down a blanket rule, just broad abstract principles which need to be interpreted on a case-by-case -case basis. An accused plea of denial of a speedy trial cannot be defeated by saying that the accused did not at any time demand a speedy trial. You can't expect the accused to say, oh, give me a fast trial. The prosecution says, well, you go to the prosecution, the court asks the prosecution, well, Mr. Public Prosecutor or Mr. State, uh, why have you not, uh, why has there not been a speedy trial in this case? Why has this been, case been going on for 10 years? The public prosecutor cannot turn around and say, oh, well, the defendant never asked for a speedy trial, so we thought we could take 10 to 15 years. You can't do that. The court has to balance and weigh several relevant factors, right? And determine in each case whether the right to a speedy trial has been denied in a given case. Charge or conviction must be quashed if the court comes to the conclusion that the right to a speedy trial of an accused has been infringed. But this is not the only course, right? It is open to the court to make any other appropriate order, including an order to conclude the trial within a fixed time period. The court can say, okay, we are now issuing directions to you the prosecution, this has to be concluded within a particular time, right? Or they might issue directions to a lower court and say, you have to conclude this trial. This is if it's the high court, for example, the trial court and say, you have to do it within a particular period of time, right? And they can, it's not advisable or practical to fix any time limit is what the Supreme Court said. Not fixing an outer limit, right, essentially says, right, not fixing any outer limit does not ineffectuate the guarantee of the right to a speedy trial. So basically what they're saying is that, look, uh, we can't set an outer limit. We can't lay down a general rule that, okay, if all trials have to be completed before 10 years from the moment the FIR is filed or the charge sheet is filed, basically. 
Now let's come to the all important Article 39A, which was inserted in the Constitution by the Indira Gandhi government Article in the 1970s. Article 39A lays down the directive principle of state policy with regard to equal justice and free legal aid. Article 39A of the Constitution states that the state shall secure that the operation of the legal system promotes justice on a basis of equal opportunity and shall in particular provide free legal aid by suitable legislation or schemes or in any other way to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen by reason of economic or other disabilities. Article 39 imposes on the state a duty to essentially ensure that every person gets legal representation. In Khatri versus State of Bihar, several blind prisoners were not provided with legal representation from the time of their initial appearance in front of a judicial magistrate till their remand orders were passed. Those of you who have seen the famous film Ganga Jal might recall this case. The magistrate's records show that no legal representation was asked for and thus not provided. The magistrate himself had not asked the accused at any stage if they wanted to be defended by lawyers. The Supreme Court reaffirmed the right to legal representation. And they, uh, and they said the right to legal representation begins when the accused is first brought before a magistrate and not merely at the trial stage. It is at this stage that the accused is at the highest risk and thus he is entitled to legal representation. The court remarked that it would be unfair to expect an illiterate person to ask for representation. He most likely doesn't even know that he is entitled to this right. He has probably no idea of the procedures of the court. So how can you place that burden of asking for legal representation on an indigent person, basically? So, under Article 39A, there was a mandate to set up something known as the legal, they've, using a mandate under Article 39A, they set up the Legal Services Authority Act. In 1987, the Indian Parliament enacted the Legal Services Authority Act, which gives an expansive meaning to legal services to include legal advice, even, apart from legal representation in cases. Section 12 of the Act lists out the categories of persons automatically entitled to legal aid without having to satisfy a means test. This includes a number of the historically and socially disadvantaged groups like the scheduled caste or scheduled tribes, victims of trafficking, forced labor, persons with disabilities, and any person uh, who has been a victim of a mass disaster, ethnic violence, caste atrocities, flood, drought, earthquake, or industrial disaster. The Legal Services Authority Act set up a network of legal aid institutions at the village, district, and state level, and the National Legal Services Authority, which oversees the implementation of the Act. The functions of NALSA include organizing legal aid camps in rural areas, slums or labor colonies with a dual purpose of educating the weaker sections of society as to their rights as well as encouraging the settlement of disputes through Lok Adalats or People's Courts. This is a picture of the logo of the National Legal Services Authority which and the motto of the authority is access to justice for all. I guess the motto says it all. Now what is the ambit of legal services under the Act? Essentially, the Act says, right, under Article 39 of the Constitution, we have a mandate, so we've set up the National Legal Services Authority to oversee the implementation of the Act. They've also set up Lok Adalas. They've also said you will get access to legal representation, right? Obviously, legal services means in-court representation if you've been charged with a criminal offense. But does that stop there? Does it extend to civil remedies? Does it extend to legal advice? Under the Act, legal service includes the rendering of any service in the conduct of any case or other legal proceeding before any court or other authority or tribunal and the giving of advice on any legal matter. The legal services authorities, after examining the eligibility criteria of an applicant and the existence of a prima facie case in his favor, provide him counsel at state expense, pay the required court fee in the matter and bear all incidental expenses in connection with the case. So, students. Let's come to the, so let's sum up the module. We've seen that India's judiciary has taken a proactive role in expanding the scope and ambit of an individual's right to a fair trial. The executive and the legislature have been left with no choice but to follow the judiciary's lead and introduce Article 39A into the Constitution. This right to fair trial includes the right to be presumed innocent. It goes beyond just the presumption of innocence and a right to a fair hearing. It includes within its ambit the right to a speedy trial and an adequate defense. Unfortunately, will the citizens of this country have the while the citizens of this country have the benefit of fair trial laws, its implementation at the ground level has often been lacking due to willful default 
in many cases. So the right to fair trial on paper in India is absolutely rock solid. But on the ground, the realities are far different. We can only hope that in the future, the dire situation in India's courts, inordinate delays will be eased. In the Indian state and the courts have appro uh, approached this problem from many perspectives. They've looked at it from the perspective of fast track courts, speedy trial, uh, quashing prosecutions, essentially, compensating victims. But nevertheless, the sheer number of cases that are, that, that are uh, the sheer number of cases the population of the country have meant that there needs to be better implementation and the population can never be uh, excused eternally. Therefore, the right to a fair trial in terms of implementation is still very much lacking.